been doing a theme this month on worship, and it's been a real honor to talk about worship. Uh, even though I'm not musical, um, we're talking about a, a lifestyle of worship. Because although we sing in a time of worship, uh, true worship in the Word is seen in a life fully lived, fully loving God, um, fully honoring God, and fully worshiping God, not only in its lips or with its lips, but also with its heart, with its behavior. And so we're, I'm excited to talk about reverence and awe today. Um, and if you want to turn your Bibles to Hebrews 12, 27 through 29, we'll be there. But we'll also be talking about uh, in Deuteronomy uh, 5, 4 uh, through 15. We've been talking about the first four commandments uh, in the Bible because they're actually the first, they're the four commandments in the, in the Old Testament that Jesus talks about uh, what is the greatest commandment. They ask him this question, the Lord asks him this question, and he goes, he says, well, it's twofold, right? So you've got a love for God with your full being. And I, last week I talked about uh, this element, but it's what our neon sign is based on, is loving God with your full being uh, and then loving your neighbor as yourself. And so this is what all of the commandments rest on, is this foundation of love for God and for others. And so you see this and you see that the first four commandments deal with God. And last week we talked about those first two commandments. This week we're going to touch on uh, not using the Lord's name in vain um, and keeping the Sabbath. Uh, so that's three and four. And we're going to touch on those things, but we're going to start in Hebrews 12, 27 through 29, so we can see how God approaches us in these very, very foundational areas of our life. And the foundations of language and work. These are a huge part of our life. And so God uh, wants to visit us in these places, and he wants to purify us in these areas. And we can see that in verse 27. It says, this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Okay, so there's a, there's, there's a few things to understand about this. One is that, that the shaking is actually a really helpful part of our process. When your life gets shook, when your mind gets shook, when your emotions get shook, it's actually really helpful to understanding what are enduring and foundational and internal, eternal elements. Uh, so God is eternal, and we've received an eternal, unshakable kingdom. So when you get shook, it's actually really helpful for you to recognize the parts of your foundation which were not God, the parts of your behavior which were not God, and so you get in that shaking season in time a purification process that gets to take place. And this is why it says, let us, have, uh, and let us offer to God an acceptable worship, which means that there is an unacceptable worship to God. And now uh, we get caught up sometimes because we're like, well, who can really say that? You know, how could you know? Who could judge me? Well, God can, one. And that's the important thing to recognize is that God's truth is the highest truth. So you've got to meet with God and you've got to identify if your worship is acceptable if your posture is acceptable, if your life is acceptable, or if it's an unacceptable lifestyle of worship. And this is something for you to meet with God on, and this is something for you to actually identify. Uh, it's not just a nice concept we talk about on Sunday, but when you're really dealing with a lifestyle of worship, this will get into areas that you can't fake. So your language, it's really hard to fake your language 24-7. It's really hard to fake that. It's really hard to fake those things which are work, uh, that, uh, the amount that you work, the amount... It's really hard to fake those things. Those are going to come from what you actually are. So you're going to work from your being. You're going to speak from your being. And so God will visit you in these places if you'll allow him to, which is why it says with reverence and awe. Okay, so reverence and awe. When I went from having a religious expression um, in, uh, in church to a relational one, which is what we talk about a lot, right? This isn't a religion, this is a relationship. How many of you have heard that phrase? How many of you love that phrase and believe in it and recognize it, identify with it as being powerful for your life? It shifts you from rules and legalistic-based expressions in church to relational-based ones. And that's an important shift because it's supposed to be love that is the foundation of transformation. 
It provides the foundation. It provides the boundary. It provides the juice, the engine. Love is such a powerful and important uh, element in all of this. So we see this and we understand that we need to move from religion to relationship and we embrace that. And, and what I find interesting is religion, uh, it focuses a lot on a fear of pain and punishment or it focuses a lot on what it likes to call reverence and honor for God. And so it leverages some language to try and express what it means to have a reverence for God. And a lot of times it leads to, to fear of punishment from God. Uh, so religion tries to shape reverence, but we've got to learn in our relationship, our loving relationship with God, what it means to inherit, to express, and to recognize a reverence for the Lord. So God loves you fully, and we revere God. And this reverence is so interesting to me because there's a fear of the Lord in this place that can, in a relationship with God, sometimes be hard to understand because we're carrying a religious model of reverence. So the religious model of reverence uh, it would make it would have rules like kids can't come into worship and be on the stage, right? It, it is disruptive and it's not honoring of the presence of God. So it would make up rules in a sanctuary environment, uh, like kids can't run around. You got to dress a certain way. You've got to have your hair done up a certain way. And so in a religious formula, it's really concerned about the outside of the cup. It's really concerned about the outside of the tomb or the outside of the building, and it wants it to look really good on the outside, right? So reverence is not deep in a religious formula. It's surface. But when you have a relationship with God, your reverence is actually supposed to go to a heart level. It's supposed to go to, though. hey, listen, they're, they're, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So you're supposed to have an honor for God, not only in your lip service, in your singing of songs about God, but it's supposed to be true to your heart. So in this uh, scenario, in this lifestyle, uh, reverence can't be a surface expression. It has to be a heart expression. It has to go to the deepest places of your life. It has to go to the very meaningful places of your language and of your work and of your rest and of your recovery and your repair. It has to go to these places. And, and this is why reverence is important. If you don't revere God, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to be shaped in God's image in those deep ways. Because reverence is meant to be the posture that we have towards God that gives him the highest seat of honor in our life. Are you tracking with me right now? So the question you have to ask in terms of if you're doing a litmus test, do I revere God? You have to ask yourself who holds the highest place of power in your life. If the answer isn't God, then you have not found a reverence for the Lord. You can like his sentiments, you can like his community, you can like his things, but if, if we're talking about a reverence and an honor for the Lord, it has to be seen that it holds, God holds the highest place of honor and power in our life. And this is important because it says, for God, for our God is a consuming fire, which means that when, it hold, when God holds the highest place of honor in our life, he gets permission he gets permission to come with his fire and burn up impurities, even ones that we would consider core to our life or foundational to our life. If you've allowed God to purify you to your core or in your core, or in your foundation, it's very destabilizing. It's even weakness inducing. And it makes you feel like, whoa, where am I standing? Because when God redoes your foundation, you don't your sense of where you're standing is shifting. Uh, and, and there's a purpose that God removes you from your, your baseless life, from the sand-based homes and infrastructures, and he moves you from these places, which creates instability, and he places you on the rock, which is Jesus. And this is meant to be a very significant and a very intentional process the Holy Spirit, you can come and you can move me to the very places even of foundation, to the core places, to the places of language. Like, if you think about how your language is, 
Uh, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. You know, this really starts to visit language to the point of even it not being useless. Because we think of like, okay, well, I'm not going to use the Lord's name in vain, which means I'm not going to cuss with God's name, right? And a lot of times people think about this. Using the Lord's name in vain is, oh, that person cussed with God's name. But using the Lord's name in vain is, if you, if you understand what vain means in this regard, it's actually producing no result or useless. So it's not just refraining from a language of God or about God or God's name to being one of not cursing, but it's also going to the place that when I, I reserve that name of God to the point where it has use all of the time and it's never empty and it's never uh, 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 fruitless, but it's always filled. Whenever I use the name of the Lord, it's always filled with the full intentionality of love, of reverence, of honor. I'm in awe of God. And so my language about God is reserved to those places of very useful worship, very useful testimony of God, so that when somebody hears me talk about God, when I think about God in my heart, when I am in those places of heart or in those places of lip, I am in a place of honoring the name of God. And so this is relational because I'm not just honoring the name of God as like a title or a surface dwelling creature, right? Like a, I, I got to go deeper than that. So my heart has to actually honor God. Because I can get away with it and people around me could be like, man, that guy really honors God. And then you'd go, well, how do you know? And he's, well, he just says the right things. Okay, so that may be true. It may not be true to their heart. God judges the heart. He looks to the heart of the matter. So somebody could be doing great lip service, and you could be like, man, that's a, that's a preacher right there. That's a teacher right there. But you may not actually recognize that in their heart of hearts, there is not a true honor for the Lord. God would recognize it. So what I'm saying is that we must allow this consuming, purifying fire of God to visit us to the deepest places the rooted places of our language. So out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, which means that I understand that my words are a fruit of whatever roots I have deep down inside in my heart, which is actually really great because if your mouth whoop, floods something out that doesn't honor God and doesn't love people, you actually get to see, that's a shaking moment right there. You're like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. That's not God. That's not love. That's not honor. But look at that. That's not a reverence. Okay, so what, so what is that? What do I do about it? See, it may not be what you actually believe, but the fact that you said it means that something produced it to come out. Maybe you said something mean and hateful because you wanted to hurt that person because you've been hurt by them. So you may not actually believe that that is truth what you said, but it's true that you wanted to hurt them. It's true that you wanted to even the odds. It's true that you wanted to create damage to get back. So you've got to recognize that your mouth is very revealing to your heart state. Very revealing, which means if I'm going to encourage you to have an action item on this, it would be to invite God as an all-consuming fire to visit your heart and to purify your heart so that your heart can honor God, have a reverence of God, and that your lips will be a match to what your heart is. So you might go, okay, well, what do I do about all those words you said? You said a lot of words, so, so what's my simple takeaway? And it would be this, is focus every single day on allowing God, one of his names, all-consuming fire. That's one of his names, all-consuming fire. So an all-consuming fire does all-consuming fire things. So just open up your heart, let it in, and it will start to do what is in its nature to do. So the start of it is open up the door that God's been knocking on of your heart, let him in, and let the house fire begin. So you can trust that the fire of God is going to burn up what should be burnt up. And what should remain 
in God will remain. That's what Hebrews 12, 27 is talking about. You can trust that the shaking God, the God that shakes the thing, the God that burns, the God that he will do it perfectly accurately. Which means that when God comes and visits you and you allow him to uh, have that place of fire shaping, that it will enhance your fathering, your mothering, that it will actually purify your, in, your intentions. It'll actually make you wiser. So it'll actually shed and burn up the impurities of foolishness, of lustfulness, of pride. So you can trust that the fire of God will absolutely make you a, a better version of yourself in the roles that you have. You can trust that the fire of God will do that. You could trust that the fire of God is very accurate to burning up the impurities and maintaining the integrity of that gold and actually enhancing its integrity by removing impurities. So you can see this. You can see that there's this very powerful visitation we've got to allow God to have. Reverence is going to be a key posture for us. Reverence is going to be a key posture for us. When I was in sports, coaches always loved a coachable person, right? And why, why did they like that posture? Because they had things they wanted to give to the athlete, but coachability was the posture that allowed them to give it to them. Now, in our relationship with God, reverence is the posture that allows God to come as a fire. If you lack a reverence for God, you're not going to permit God to come as a fire. So you must unlock this posture between you and the Lord where you revere God. And you have this fear of the Lord that allows him to come and visit as a fire and burn up impurities. Because that, it doesn't just stop at your heart and the language that you have coming out of your heart. It actually begins to visit the places of work and the places of rest, which we see in verse 12 of Deuteronomy. Um, and so we see this. It goes, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And if you skip to 15, you'll actually see why. Because there's a reason. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. When God tells you to do something, there is a reason why. You might not know it, but in this context, the reason why he is inviting and telling and commanding you to have a Sabbath expression in your life is because there is something that happens in a rest day that cannot happen in a work day. There is a growth, there is a healing, there is a recovery, there is a remembrance that happens in a rest day that doesn't happen in a work day. Because there's a certain engine that goes when you're working, you're on that grind, right? And it's almost like it has a pace and an energy of its own, right? It's like you're in a cog in a machine, and it's just rolling, and momentum and inertia just keep you going. And then all of a sudden you're like, I've worked 25 days straight. And or you might express certain workaholism things and just work is your comfort, it's your joy, it's your love, it's your passion. And so you might see some of these different patterns, but what you have to understand about your relationship with God is there's, there's things that happen when you choose to rest with God that cannot happen when you work with God. This is relational. This is understanding that your loving relationship with God means that there are things that God's going to do to you in rest. And I like to pull in science or psychology to some of these things because a lot of times they actually illuminate God's principles in the Word. And so I, I actually looked up the significance of a Sabbath or sabbatical when it comes to the mind in psychology. And it says the concept of a Sabbath, an assurance that at least once a week we get to move into safety physiology, to heal, be healthy and well. It's one of recovery and therefore resilience. The physiology of threat leads to reactive mind, whereas the physiology of safety brings forward the creative mind. So even in a psychological observation, a scientific observation of the mind and the experience of the person, 
it actually reveals that in a work scenario, you're reactive, right? And you're constantly dealing with problems, problem solving, uh, create, needing to do all kinds of things, right? And you're always just boom, here, here, there. And it's almost like it pulls you through your day, the amount of work you got to do. Uh, and, and so you're in a certain state of mind. You're in a certain posture when it comes to labor, when it comes to work. But when God invites you to this different place of rest, it's actually because he wants to heal you. He wants to allow you to operate, to be in a posture that he, you can get something from him that you couldn't get in the effort of labor. So when it comes to the lifestyle of worship, there's a reason you stop working. And it's not just so you could be less productive. It's not just because you're quote unquote lazy. It's not because you're not ready to, to grind and get the job done. But the reason that we rest with the Lord is one, we trust him that six days of working with him and one day of working uh, or of resting with him is more effective than seven days of working on our own. So this is a lifestyle of worship, and that's why I said we've got to have a reverence for the Lord that allows it to go to the places of language and of work. Because you know what's crazy about the way we work is it's almost so deep within us that we don't even actually realize it's untouchable even in a relationship with God. They're like, this is just how I work. This is what I do. This is how I was raised. This is how I was taught. Like, if I don't do it, Nobody eats. If I don't do it, then my wife can't be proud of me for not providing everything the family needs. Sometimes we don't actually realize that our identity of ourselves as a worker and a laborer is greater than our identities as a son or a daughter of God. So you've got to be inviting in this place of reverence for the Lord that, Lord, I'll even hold my identity as a son or daughter of you higher and deeper and greater than I do my identity as a laborer or as a producer. So when somebody goes from having a production, so we actually see it in ministry a lot, right? So somebody goes from being a pastor full-time or ministry full-time, they leave that thing, and then they're like, I don't even know who I am. Because what happened is, the problem that took place is they became what they were producing rather than becoming like God. So your production becomes your identity, your might of force, your labor ability, your skill as a craftsman, your skill as a commuter, communicator became your identity. It became your source of confidence and strength. And you perhaps forgot that God was the one who brought you out of Egypt in the first place. And maybe you forgot it because you haven't been practicing that spiritual practice of Sabbath and rest with the Lord where you're supposed to remember that it was God who freed you, that it was God who pulled you up out of that place of bondage that you couldn't have got out by yourself so the seventh day the rest day the sabbath expression is meant to level your pride and remember remember who did it remember who started it remember who shaped you remember that you would be nothing except that god sent his son to die on the cross so that you could receive the fullness of life it's meant to level the whole thing it's most level the pride that comes from our seven days of working on our own, for our own goals, our own gains, our own ambitions, our own agenda. The beautiful thing I love about this Sabbath language is not only talking about rest, it's like six days you shall work. It's also talking about work. For some of us, that's the message we need to hear. It's like, what are you laboring on? What are you working on? Because there is a design that God has put inside of you to create and to produce things. To work the proverbial ground. To plow ground. To sow seeds. To water those seeds. To, 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 to bring in the harvest. God has designed you to have purpose in your labor and to do it. And this might be a little bit weird because some of us dream of the day where we wouldn't have to work. We're like, man, it would be nice to not work. But I've talked to a lot of retired folks, a lot, because I'm really curious about that. I'm really curious about what it means to be retired, because I want to retire like, like at 48 from ministry, you know? That's when Monroe's 18. I've told you guys that before. Jess and I, we're moving. We're getting out. 
and my kids can stay, but they'll be living with the new tenants, you know? I joke, I joke. It's not a hard line. Semi-hard line. <laughs> no, but, but I, I'm very curious about this thing. You know, it, 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 when you don't have to work for financial reasons, what do you work on? Because it's in you to create. It's in you to produce. It's in you to, to, to work and labor on something and you might not have a passion or purpose on what you work on. And I would encourage you to find what God is designing you to work on. To find your calling, to find your vocational purpose, to find it. And you might not like the job you're in right now. So, okay, find another skill set that is purposeful for you. Find another arena, develop yourself, grow yourself, do it in your off time after you're working. If you're a father or mother, you don't necessarily have to just quit your purposeful list job that you feel you have, but just work after work to be able to work in another arena. <laughs> Sometimes it's like folks get the uh, burn the ships mentality, you know, so you can never go back. Yeah, all right, cool. If God leads you to do that, then God leads you to do that. But it doesn't have to be your rule of thumb every time you want to transition from one career or vocation to another. God, God can lead you in a transitional, a wise transitional model that has you accumulating skill sets and accumulating things like this is what I'm doing right now. Like my, one of my goals for this community is for me not to take a salary from this community at all. And so I want to build and I'm building businesses that can allow me to be able to do ministry and not have to take any salary. This is a process, right? It's building businesses, it's learning the skill sets and growing in them. It's humbly receiving from people and growing in my understanding and the models of business and how to do it, how to operate in it. And this is a process. This is a transitional one that God is giving me wisdom, growing my wisdom, and I'm asking God for wisdom. So all of this to say, a very simple notion on this thing to really, really understand is that God and having a reverence for God means that we allow his all-consuming fire to visit us in our language, in our work, in our rest. I don't know necessarily what that looks like for you. I could perhaps sit with you and see pragmatically what it looks like, but I know that it's vital to a life of worship for us to speak in a manner that honors the Lord and for us to work in a manner that is connected to God's design and purpose for us and to rest in a manner that allows us to find the humility, to find the story of God again on how it's freed us and share it with others and be in that place of true recovery and healing.